Thanks for joining us as we continue our study through the book of Psalms. It's our prayer that you are encouraged and that you grow as you open up your Bible and pray that God would speak to your hearts. It's our hope that you're hungrier to walk with Him closely, intimately, and that He impacts your life for His glory and for your good. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for your word and that it doesn't return to you void. Father, we pray that you speak to us as we, uh, we want to receive what you have for us. And we know that it's by your spirit that we have life. It's by your, uh, your spirit that you changed us and not by any works that we have done. But we give you glory and we thank you today and ask that you move in power in our lives in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Okay, so we left off on Psalm 112. If you would turn with me in your Bible. You might have seen on Facebook, I put a couple pictures this week, what I had highlighted and underlined. So if you uh, see, the first verse was one that stood out to me very profoundly. Praise the Lord. Blessed is a man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. Uh, if you remember Psalm 1, it talks about blessed is a man who, who meditates on the, day, on the law of the Lord day and night. Um, there is a blessing to trusting in the Lord and meditating on his word. And Psalm 119, we're about to hit on, it is the longest chapter in the Bible. And it all, all but four verses out of the 160 eight or so have to do with the word of God and how blessed we are to delight in the word. So verse two, he, uh, his descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house and his righteousness endures forever. I like how it says wealth and riches, but it's not necessarily money. It's the things that money can't buy that God gives us, right? And uh, something Christians get a bad rap for is not being courageous or we get, I don't know, demonized or called bigots. But really it says that his descendants will be mighty on the earth. Then we're actually pretty meek. Like we could be a lot more bold than we are. We could say a lot of things that we don't say. We could do a lot of things that we don't do as children of God because we are trying to walk in the spirit in tune with the spirit to do what is best for the most amount of people. And sometimes putting someone in their place is not, I mean, we love our enemies. And so that's the mystery. There is, uh, the world doesn't understand us. The things of the, the flesh don't understand the things of the spirit, but we will be mighty on the earth. We are mighty. The meek will inherit the earth. We are under control though, like a horse with a bridle and with a bit in its mouth. We want the Holy spirit to lead us, but wealth and riches are his. And we'll be in his house and righteousness, his righteousness endures forever. I highlighted the word forever there. Uh, we see in this world that righteousness usually is kind of come by day, come by night. It, it doesn't really last. You see someone who's really a righteous, upright, cool, honest, wonderful person. And if they become famous, you know, it's the, the world wants to tear them down sooner than you can imagine, but we have a righteousness through Christ that endures forever. We have a righteousness that's not contingent on our ability, but on our faith, believing in the Lord and what he's done in his ability. Unto the upright, there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. This is the nature of God. Verse five, a good man deals graciously and lends. We should be generous people in the Lord. He will guide his affairs with discretion. We should be wise. So generous and wise. There's something to be said for that. There's people that come to the church and they want the church to give to them. Or there's a lot of causes, even Christian causes, that you get mailers about. Hey, there's a really big need here. Well, we want to be gracious. We want to be, uh, have a generous eye. But there is wisdom to how you can be generous and knowing that the Lord is leading you and not just uh, being duped 
sometimes. So uh, he will guide his affairs with discretion. We should be the wisest people on earth. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. So basically we have an assurance here. We sing a couple years ago with Joey. We introduced a song with you guys and uh, it says, uh, whatever may come my way or our way through fire or pouring, pouring rain, no, we won't be shaken. We won't be shaken. And the idea is uh, no matter, no matter the trial, no matter the, the bad news, and I've definitely seen plenty of headlines lately. I've been looking at the news pretty closely in the days that we live in, and yet God is not shaken, and we will not be shaken, and he is from everlasting to everlasting. He's on his throne, amen? Jesus is sitting on the throne. We have nothing to be afraid of. And for the end of verse 8, until he sees his desire upon his enemies. As we remember in Psalm 2, all these nations rage and they plot a vain thing against the Lord. They say, let's break his bonds asunder. Let's, let's break free from the rule of God. And in the end, God holds them in derision. He scoffs at them. He laughs at them because he's like, your day's coming. I'm going to judge you. If you don't repent, you deserve this. And so that's what it's saying there in verse 8. We're going to see God's judgment. And we don't want people to perish. We don't want people to suffer that judgment. But if they persist in rebellious, rebellious hearts, then that's what's going to happen. So uh, we don't have to be moved, though. Uh, trust in the Lord with all of our hearts, leaning not to our own understanding. He will direct our path. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, uh, Do not be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. Then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 9, He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted with honor. The wicked will see it and be grieved. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. On your outline, you see here, uh, verse 10, The prosperity of the godly shall be an eyesore to the wicked. Let me uh, throw a couple things out there just for you to ponder. Um, if we fear the Lord, we're blessed, like it says there on the outline, and godliness has the promise, the promises of this life and the life to come. We are blessed now and we will be blessed forevermore. And I would say that we provoke unbelievers to envy. When you are experiencing the blessing and the spirit and the power of God in your life, people will be envious because they want what we have. But in the same token, they can have what we have easily just by believing in the Lord themselves. True wealth and righteousness versus what the world has. You know, think about verse 4. Um, they're going back to verse uh, 3. The wealth and riches that the Lord gives us, look at what the world offers. Get rich quick. Here's your money. Here's your pleasure. Here's your fame. And we look at King Solomon. He had all of that. And he was disillusioned. And he said, it's all vanity. It doesn't mean anything. And so we know that we have something that does mean a lot. Joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We have salvation. We have promises from God. We are joint heirs with Christ. Everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to us through faith in Him. And we're never shaken. We don't have to be afraid. And it's God's perfect love that casts out our fear. Um, and you know the generosity and the honor in verse 9 that we see there's something about dispersing unto the broad and giving to the poor that is the nature of our God in heaven. God wants to give. God is a giver. Like Pastor Alice said, God's a giver and he's given to the poor and he never is late and he's never short on resources and he will be honored. Uh, it's just amazing though that we, we get our eyes off of him so quickly. Let's look at verse uh, 1 of Psalm 113. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Sorry. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. So some people are like, you really need to praise the Lord on Sundays. Okay. You need to praise the Lord in the mornings. Have a good morning devotional time. Okay. Oh, you need to praise the Lord in the evening. 
Is there a bad time to praise the Lord? There's never a bad time. And this says here, from, from the rising of the sun to it's going down. What this basically is saying, it doesn't matter where you're living uh, and what time of day it is. He is to be praised. And, and Jesus even put it this way. He said, if they don't praise me when they're singing Hosanna, when he came in the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, he said, if they don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. He's like, even nature praises me. So I'd rather be the one who beats nature to the punch. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the thing. All day long, verse 3, I put that out in the margin. Verse 4, the Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth? He has to step down to look into the things that we find complex. He has to leave the complexities and the beauty and the glory of heaven to come down and to know the intimacies of the problems we have and the issues that we're facing. He humbles himself to behold. I like verse 4 where it says he's above all nations. There's no nation that, uh, that is not under his uh, authority. And his glory is above the heavens. And I like verse 5. Who is like our God? Really, there is no one like him. Uh, I've said it many times before. Allah is no true God. He's a demon. Uh, he says you can lie. He's the moon God. There are no true gods except the God of heaven. His, the Father in heaven, our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the three in one. He humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth. He raises the poor out of the dust. He lifts the needy out of the ash heap that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people, he grants the barren woman a home like a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. So he takes misfits. He takes us, us ordinary people, and he makes us princes and princesses. He makes us kings and queens, so to speak. We're joint heirs with Christ. Just to meditate and ponder on that. There is no other religion where they guarantee them that they will have seats of authority it's just this wing in a prayer, hope upon hope, that if I do enough good things, that I'll be in heaven. But it says here, it's he who does the work. He lifts us out of the ash heap. You know, who remembers that before they came to know Christ, that the hope that they were experiencing in their life was nothing short of an ash heap? The, the meaning you found in your life before Christ was nothing more than an ash heap. Psalm 40 talks about how I waited on the Lord and he delivered me. He pulled me out of the muck and the mire and set my feet upon the rock. Whose life was like the mud and the muck and the mire? I may have looked clean on the outside, but I know that my intents and my, my heart was, was incredibly uh, burnt up and, and filthy. And the Lord plucked me out of that. I'm so thankful for that. That he may seat him with princes, the princes of his people, I like how Jesus put it when this woman, she said, hey, you know, have mercy, have mercy on me, have, you know, on my son, or, you know, she's a Samaritan woman, or she's a, a Gentile, and saying to Jesus, I want what you have, I need your healing, and he says, hey, it's not good, I came for the lost sheep of Israel, I'm, it's not good to give to the dogs what's supposed to be given to the children, and she goes, but what about the little puppies? Like in the Greek, she's like, what about even the puppies get to eat the, the scraps that fall off the table from the kids? So she's like, you may call us dogs, but we still. And she said, no, you know, and he looked at her faith and he said, I tell you the truth that, that sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, harlots, all these uh, weird or these terrible sinful people are piling into the kingdom. And they take it by force. And he says, and they will sit at the, at the table with, with uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and all those who came before. The other thing is he had a centurion. The centurion had so much faith in him. He's, this is a Gentile Roman leader of a hundred men. He, he managed a hundred men. And he said, hey, please heal my servant or heal my son. You don't have to come to my house. I'm not worthy that you even come to my house. Just say the word. My servant will be healed. And Jesus says, nowhere in all of Israel have I seen faith like this. And he said the same kind of thing. At the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you'll see people like this man. So here we have 
Uh, God's seeding us into his kingdom. We're Gentiles. I wasn't raised Jewish. I don't know anyone in here. You raise your hand if you, you were raised Jewish. Okay. Uh, when, was your, when was your bar mitzvah? But anyways, I don't know that uh, heritage that the Jews knew. Yet they passed down the oracles and the word of God to us to be able to know that a Messiah was to come and, and we get to see him in Jesus Christ. This is written a thousand years before Christ. He grants a barren woman a home and like a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. There's a, a piece. You re, remember, uh, I'm going to go on a sidetrack here, but it's right on, right on track with this verse. If you remember Philip, Philip was in Samaria. Philip was seeing people come to know Christ. There were a lot of salvations, just people after people, miracles, signs and wonders. And he was caught up by the Lord and told to go to the road, uh, on, on the road away from Jerusalem toward Ethiopia, where he ran into a eunuch. He literally ran and saw the chariot, right? So he hops in the chariot. And what is this Ethiopian eunuch reading except Isaiah 53? And he says, what are you reading there? Or he says, I have a question here. And Philip's like, what can I do for you, basically? And he says, I want to know who is this man talking about himself or another? Because it said that after this man, there will be no heritage, no descendants to follow him. And it was, Psalm, or it was, prop, it was Isaiah 53, where it talks about the suffering servant who would be led like a sheep to the slaughter and open not his mouth. And that his, his visage or his body would be so marred, he wouldn't even resemble a man. But yet this is a prophecy Isaiah made of Jesus. And within one or two chapters, Isaiah 54, 55, it talks about the eunuchs and people who don't have children. And yet in the kingdom that they will have a heritage, they will have descendants, they will have children in the sense of people that um, God... Uh, in Jesus' own terms, he said, if you deny your mother, your father, your husband, your wife, your children, if you love me more than them, you'll receive, you know, 10, 20, 30, 100 fold. Basically, he's saying you'll receive so much more in the kingdom with persecutions. You're going to have a persecuted life, but you're going to have all that that you could have ever hoped for in this life if you just follow after me. So that is the same theme here at the very end of Psalm 113. It's in Isaiah 55, 54 region. Then you have uh, Jesus telling us very clearly in the Gospels, if we deny ourselves and we follow after him, that he has a heritage for us. That's such a good news thing, I think, too, for single young women and young men uh, or people that feel. And Jesus told the disciples, here's another teaching, I think it's in Matthew 22. Uh, in that area, don't quote me necessarily, but Jesus is saying uh, it is... Uh, better that you don't marry, so to speak. Like the only reason why you can divorce is for sexual immorality. And they're like, well, if that's the case, it'd be better not to marry. And he says, well, this is difficult teaching. Not everybody can receive it, so to speak. Jesus says, but some were made, were eunuchs from birth. Some were made eunuchs by men and some are eunuchs for the glory of God. And meaning they don't marry a wife so they can focus on just pleasing the Lord. And in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul goes into great detail to describe to us that um, I wish that you, he's like, this is not the Lord necessarily, this is me, but it'd be better if you were like me and not having to please your wife or husband because who, he who is not married or she who is not married can focus on just pleasing the Lord. So there's a blessing in the undivided attention being given to the Lord because Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 6, you have to be concerned with pleasing your wife and I would save you that trouble, he says. I would save you that trouble. I love being married. My wife is the most awesome woman in the world. I'm very excited to be married. And I think it's a beautiful thing. It helps me relate with other people too. But uh, the point Jesus is saying is there's more time in your day when you're not taking care of another person. There really is. But if that is your ministry and that's what you're called to do, he's, that's why he said not everyone can receive it. Um, and then he says it's better for you to marry than to burn with lust. That's another issue too. And our culture is so lust driven and it's like, well, you should have a helpmate. You should have someone that you're with. And here it says, though, the barren woman, um, and I could say uh, it's not just the barren woman, but the single woman, but the barren woman, uh, a home, he grants a home. And there's a lot of single people that devote themselves to the body of Christ, that serve in the Sunday schools, that serve in the kids' ministries. And if they're widows or, you know, even, uh, there's just 
I think 2 Timothy or 1 Timothy says, you can enroll widows who are widows indeed. And these widows have to have washed the feet of the saints, excelled in every good work. I don't know any person at Glenville who has excelled at every good work, but they say this is if you're going to pay for a widow to be on the church's uh, dole, so to speak, or to be helping her financially, then she, one, she needs to have no family who can take care of her. And two, she needs to be one who always served, always was helping other people. You know, I can envision a couple of people that that could apply to in our church. And there's probably a lot of people that do things behind the scenes that I have no idea what they do. And I know that's a true truth uh, statement. But the point is, uh, even if you're single, even if you're widowed, even if, and that's the other thing, Paul doesn't exempt us married people. He says, and if you're married, you're supposed to live as if you're not married. Because you should be living to please the Lord first and foremost. So the point is, you please the Lord, excel in every good work, and know that God is the one giving you the ability, like it says in Philippians 2.13, both to will, to even want to, and to do according to His good pleasure. He's the one who gives you the power and the desire. So it's pretty awesome that He does that and then uh, gives us a joyful house. Uh, we have a, a place prepared for us. We're going to have... I have... I, I know... And I, this is not arrogant to say, I don't, I hope, but I know that there's going to be people that I meet in heaven that I did not ever meet on earth because of the things we're involved with, uh, with missions and the things that we give to and that we're passionate for, or people that I've shared with that then shared other people. There are going to be family, basically people who consider us dearer than their family that we get to sit down at the table in heaven with. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I try, I tried not to digress too much, but did that help kind of color that verse for you guys? You feel looking at the different perspectives on, and, and I think that's the cool thing too. We have a savior and a Lord who looks at any person in any walk of life and says, Hey, I've got a place for you in the family and you're going to have a heritage, whether you're a barren woman, uh, whether you were this, this person that was in the ash heap that I had to pluck up, um, because we all were. I mean, there's no one who's too far gone and there's no one whose story is too sad that God can't totally redeem it and give them way more than they could have ever uh, imagined. Psalm 114, when Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from the people of strange language, it's funny he calls it that, Judah became his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. The sea saw it and fled. Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams. The little hills like lambs. Uh, just a couple thoughts there on if you have your outline on Psalm 114, the first four verses. The miracles, it says, wrought by God when he brought the people out of Egypt. Uh, and then the last part of the psalm, it says, are a just cause or a just ground of fearing him. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a river just stop 30 or 40 miles upstream and just completely stop for no reason in the flood season. You know, I've, I've, never, uh, I've never seen someone walk into the water and just see it just dissipate and, and move away from their foot like dry ground, like it did for them um, when they crossed the Dead Sea, or the Red Sea, I should say. I've never seen something that miraculous, but I believe in a God who's done something that miraculous. And uh, I've seen his work in the lives of my, my family, my friends, and then you guys. So that's an encouraging thing to me. So let's look at these last five verses where, or four verses where it talks about the response. What ails you, O sea, that you fled? O Jordan, that you turned back? O mountains, that you skipped like rams? O little hills like lambs? Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water and the flint into a fountain of waters. So we don't even understand the, the way that the waters of this world work. And it, I mean, they spring up out of where? The aquifers? Well, who put the aquifers there? Well, did it happen after the flood? Did it happen before the flood? Do we, I mean, California has tons of water, but it's two miles underground, so they can't really get to it. I mean, but yet they have a drought, yet then the water comes, and then we have floods, and then we have droughts, and then, so all these complexities of the hydroecological cycle, and we really can't grasp it completely. And yet God, in his presence, he can make water do whatever he wants. And, and he did, and he will, and he does, and he's going to destroy the earth with fire one of these days, Second Peter says. 
He's going to do what he wants with, with all the molecules and make a new heaven and new earth. He's going to you know, separate all the atoms however he sees fit. But you look at that. Verse 7, I, I pointed out the word presence of the Lord. You know, because verse 5, 6, those are all uh, rhetorical questions. What is, it, what is it that makes the earth do what it does? What is it that makes people and even the kings of the earth tremble? What is it that causes... Uh, these miracles to happen, it's the presence of the Lord. If the Lord wasn't there, you know, it wouldn't happen. Jesus told them to fill the, the, the water uh, barrels at the, the wedding in Cana. I think it's John chapter 2, John chapter 3, his first miracle that's recorded in the Gospel of John. There are, I believe, I've heard over 180 processes it takes to get something from grape juice into wine. And he said, just do it, do what I say. And it's almost like the water blushed and became wine miraculously. Because it's like, oh, the Lord said it, I better do this. It, he changed all the molecules in those water barrels instantaneously because of his presence. And so that makes me so encouraged to think that he can do that with wicked, unbelieving, hard-hearted people like me, but not any longer, thank, thank the Lord. But he can do that with the people that we run into every day. He, 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 if you've heard my story, if you heard my story, I'll spend one second or one minute on it. I was a crude, sailor, cussing, uh, uh, wicked hearted young man in high school. And one person who I'm still best friends with this day walked up to me and said, why are you cussing? And it was like the presence of the Lord. I cannot explain it other than it was like Jesus was standing in vivo right in front of me. And I never wanted to cuss ever again. I was convicted. He cut me right to the heart. And all he asked was that simple question. Even to this day, he's like, that's just silly. That's not even a big deal. To me, that was a big deal. That's where the root of my wickedness, the impurity of my heart. I'm not, you know, saying that. What I'm saying is that was, that addressed a root. The Holy Spirit was like, why is your heart this way? And then I realized he had Jesus. I had religion. I had the Catholic religion. He had Jesus. I knew who Jesus was, but I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. So that was a catalyst. And I'm saying that here. What is it that made these mountains move? What is it that made the hills skip? What was it that made the water flee or recede or stop 20 miles upstream or 30 miles upstream? It was the fact that there was a response to the presence of God. And my friend was not perfect, and he still isn't. And, and he had some major lifestyle issues. But I knew that it was genuine, his relationship with Jesus Christ. And it changed me because it was the presence of God. And even now, he quickens us. In our daily lives, he convicts us. He touches our hearts. He shows us and convicts us of even more subtle things. The more we walk with the Lord, the more we realize the subtleties of how much we need him to change us. So we realize our sinfulness. We realize how much we miss the mark. So uh, just be encouraged you have a problem, you, you need him to work in someone, in you, in an area, get into his presence, recognize his presence. You don't have to climb up into a mountain or go to the depths of hell or go to the heights of heaven. He's with you right now, but acknowledge that he's with you. It's in, in the words of Paul, in the words of the New Testament, you don't have to go great efforts. Just realize that he, is, he fills all things. He fills all things. He's with us. He's omnipresent. I don't understand it, but I believe it. He is everywhere. And Jesus is always making intercession for us. He's always pleading our case. We already talked about that. Verse uh, 1 of Psalm 115. This is a wonderful anti-pride and the glory to God psalm. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold. The work of men's hands. Here we, here, here we go into what idols truly are. And that's any false God. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. What's another word for saying you can't mutter through your throat, like you can't talk? Mute, okay. 
What's another word for can't hear? Deaf, but the old, old English. They call them dumb, right? Okay. What are people who trust in idols? We become like them. We become powerless. We have hands that we can't touch. We have feet we can't move. We have mouths that we can't speak. We're mute. We have ears, but we're dumb to the truth of God. We're deaf to the... And that's what Jesus said when he quoted Isaiah. Ears I will give them, but I speak in parables because hearing they will hear, but not understand or comprehend. They'll listen, but it's like background noise because unless you have the desire to do what God wants you to do, and it's a miraculous work of God to have that soil of a, a heart that is, is ready to receive the word of God, a heart that wants God, which he's working on, but you submit and you lay that down, then unless you have that, um, basically we're falling into that idolatry every day. Um, there's, there's a definitive line in, in your walk where you transfer from death to life, from idolatry to the true God from believing in yourself or some man-made construct or believing in God, his promises and his son, Jesus Christ. Verse nine, O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of, Israel, of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. So that's us. He's our help and our shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord. Is our God a God who blesses? Why does he repeat it so often? Why do you think he repeats it so often? Why would he say he blesses? Living in the middle of the blessing, yet not remembering, not, not being thankful. Yeah, they discounted what, they, what he did. The Israelites weren't seeing his blessing. But here he's reminding, the Lord's been mindful. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel, the house of Aaron, and he will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. The Gentiles even, you know, that's us. And we are prone, like the Israelites, to forget his blessings when we're in the midst of them. And we're prone to kind of discount God, like, like uh, Rebecca was saying. That is the truth. But at the end, both small and great. You can tell a child that's three years old, God, God loves you, he sent his son. You can tell a 95 year old on their deathbed, God loves you and sent his son. And all they, it's the same thing, believe in him, believe on him, trust in him, love him. And that promise is there. So uh, for those who are listening, that repetition of God will bless us, that is the truth. God's not gonna give us junk. God's not going to give us cursings. God gives us blessings. Satan wants us to be cursed. So we get our eyes off the Lord, and that's, what's, that's all that Satan can offer us, really, is, is cursings and, and half-truths and uh, pull the rug up, out from under us. Verse 14, may the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. So that's a that promise for our children as well. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Okay, so he cares about our posterity. He cares about our heritage, our, our next generations. Uh, and he created the heavens and the earth. That's the God that we serve. He created all these beautiful, wonderful, miraculously, perfectly designed symbiotic, synergistic, like building off of each other, uh, wonderful organisms and, and plants and light and laws of gravity and motion and everything that he created, all for his glory, for us to enjoy. And yet he only wants to bless us. Even when he corrects us and brings trials our way, he wants to bless us. Un uncanny how his nature is clear here. Verse 17, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor those who go down into silence, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. So there's a song that says, not to us, not to us, but to your name be the glory. I think it's a water deep song and Chris Tomlin also did it. But uh, at the very end of that song, it talks about that. 
those who go down into silence, like once, once someone has rejected the Lord and, and enter into eternity and they, they won't believe in Him, they're not going to all of a sudden miraculously get this desire to praise the Lord because you're not going to be forced to praise the Lord uh, and want to be in heaven. You will have to acknowledge that He's Lord. But uh, the point is there, when you, why wait until you're dead to praise the Lord? <laughs> not to us, but to His name be the glory. Why are you living for yourself? Because Paul says in these terms, there are some that are living, but they love the world so much they're already dead. They're dead while they're living. They're walking dead. I don't watch that show, but that is the reality for a lot of people in our culture is they pretty much, you look at them, you talk to them because they're not born again. They don't trust in the Lord. All their affections are on things of the world. All they want to talk about is what, uh, food, drink, clothing, television, what cruise or trip they're going to go on, and there's no spiritual content. When we are told as believers, set your minds on the things above. And that is the cure. And and 1 John 3, 3, he who has this hope of Christ's return purifies himself as he is pure. So we want to be uh, in a place where we bless the Lord now. We're already experiencing those blessings now. We're in the kingdom we're taking it by force. And that is something that won't get old forever. No one's going to be in heaven that doesn't want to be there. And everybody who's in heaven will enjoy praising the Lord. So we might as well get used to that right now and enjoy it. Um, we have uh, Psalm 116 and 117. <laughs> I would uh, encourage you to read ahead. We'll probably look at 116, 117, 118. Uh, 117 is the shortest psalm in the Bible. 119 is the longest psalm in the Bible. 118 is the middle psalm of the Bible, and verse 15 is the middle verse of the Bible. Uh, it's basically, if you look at that, it's smack dab in the middle. Um, and we'll look at a little bit more of the details of how this is structured. But you think about, it doesn't matter the length or, or the, the breadth of a, a, a psalm and how many things they want to really point out about God or how little. Every point that we're learning about the nature of our Father is eternally beneficial, is eternally wondrous, and is eternally uh, important and vital. There's uh, a time when Jesus was tempted. Jesus was tempted and he said to Satan, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There is something in every one of these verses or every little stanza here that we're looking at for each of us. And what I'm excited about is we won't be in a hurry in heaven. We will have all the time we need to digest and to grow. So uh, just an encouragement. Uh, look at the world and they'll say, not to God, but to me be the glory. Look to our lives and let's show the world, not to us, but to your name be the glory. Father, we thank you so much that you have a plan for even the barren woman, for those who who really don't have much in this world. You've rescued us and you've given us a family and a place in the kingdom. You've made us princes and princesses in the kingdom by faith in the Son, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you've given us reason to praise you. You've created all things that are good and you've created everything perfectly. It was Satan and it was our sinful nature that we corrupt that which you made, which is good. I pray, Lord, that you would quicken us to respond to you in our lives and knowing just like you moved the waters and the mountains made them skip like rams, that your presence can move the mountains in our lives and part the waters where we need in every area of our lives to give over to you that which we're holding back. Father, we thank you that you go before us, that you're our rear guard and you protect us. You're our strength and our shield. We thank you for your word that is true. And we thank you and just lift you up and say, not to us, O Lord, but to your name be the glory because of your love and your faithfulness this morning. Be glorified in us and bless our friendships. Bless your church this morning and bless the preaching and teaching of your word. And uh, guide us this weekend with Convoy of Hope that multiple people would, uh, the hundreds of people would come to know you and get plugged into the body of Christ and that we would be your hands and feet in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys.
Thanks for joining us again as we continue our study through the book of Psalms. Tune in to our YouTube channel as you can find a variety of studies as they come. We will be posting them, so appreciate it if you would subscribe and share them with your friends. And feel free to join us at Glenville Church, 4604 South Seneca, Wichita, Kansas. You can reach us at 524-6801. We have Sunday morning services at 1030 a.m with Sunday school starting at 9.30 a.m. And on Wednesday evenings, we have things for all ages, including Awana, youth, and a variety of Bible studies. It's our prayer that you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen.